10 at the beginning of our time, so if you can grab your seat, we're about to begin in three seconds. Thank you very much and welcome to the fourth and final plenary. Uh, looking around, we see a lot of young learners teachers. Hands up for young learners teachers. What? <laughs> young learner teachers rocking the house. Wow, that's wonderful. I think uh, all of Murray's friends are here. <laughs> yes. So we're very, very pleased. Thank you, everybody. Let's have fun, let's enjoy, and let's learn uh, from the next session. I'd like to turn it over to Catherine to do a formal introduction of Mari. Here we go. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we've been doing uh, shout-outs uh, all, all weekend, and I have to say that some of my shout-out people are sitting in front of me, and I'm, I'm very excited to see some of them, because I haven't seen them in a very long time. One who I haven't mentioned yet, actually, is uh, Mayumi Tabuchi, so I'm very glad to see you here today. She is an excellent teacher, trainer, and influence in my teaching uh, throughout the years. Um, yesterday, I talked about Madi, uh in terms of what she was going to talk about today, but uh, who is she? Well, she has been teaching for 25 years uh, here in Japan. She teaches young learners, she teaches teenagers at her own school called English Square in Kanazawa City, Japan. And um, she has published many ELT materials. Uh, she does numerous teacher training seminars uh, around Japan. And uh, she also uh, got her teaching English to young learners, uh, master's degree from Aston University. Um, and she has been volunteering uh, within the young learner community uh, here at JALT uh, by writing a learner's column since 2015 uh, in the TLT. And uh, for me, uh, as I imagine for many of you here, uh, Madi has been a really important role model. Uh, as a teacher, a presenter, uh, and as a professional in the young learner field. She really shows you how to do it on many levels. Added to that, she is just a good human being. Uh, she really is. <laughs> and when I think about Mari, uh, I think about her smile when she is on the stage and how she so generous, generously shares her ideas. And it was uh, this summer that I was going through my teaching materials and I came across socks. This is one of the activities that you showed in one of the uh, presentations that you did. Oh yeah, I remember. Do you remember yeah, socks? Remember. Remember. Okay, remember. yes. I, bingo. I went home that day, hit the caffeine, and I got socks. And I took this activity into my classroom and I used it and the students went wild. And I knew this was someone I could always go to, I could always depend on her. And it gave me a real sense that I was making a difference because she was teaching me. So it is with incredible, true honor that I welcome Mari Nakamura. Thank you. Oh my God, <laughs> too good. Where do I start? Uh, water bottle, I'm sorry, I drink lots of water. Hello everybody. Hello. 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 Um, I hope you had a good lunch. You did? <laughs> Yes. Good. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, a shout out seems to be a thing here. So let me give you, all of you, a big shout out, especially the JALT officers and JALT volunteers and the pink shirt, nobody here? The, the pink shirt volunteers backstage here, yeah. So please give everybody a big hand for everybody and for yourself. It is my great honor to share my experience as a teacher of young learners today with you. Thank you so much. I started teaching English 25 years ago in this beautiful city. Do you know where it is? It is Joetsu City in Niigata. I only had one class for young learners 
and several private lessons for adult learners. And back then, I just imagined that, you know, teaching kids would be easier than teaching adults. <laughs> I was wrong, <laughs> dead wrong. You know what I mean, if you are teaching kids? And uh, it was a time before the internet. Can you imagine that? There was no teacher's group on the internet. There was no social media. So I was pretty much on my own with David Paul's teaching book. Is your t um, David here? Please give him a call, a big, big applause to him. Um, maybe he's not here, um, or maybe he's hiding somewhere in here. Um, that was pretty much it, you know, that I had back then. I didn't have anything else. I was pretty much on my own. And I opened my own school in 2001 in Kanazawa City. And I tried this project, a little exchange project with a public elementary school in Los Angeles. Um, just a little exchange, very, very simple. How did it go? It was a total flop, total failure. I failed my students, that, that's how I failed. Why? Because my students' reading and writing level was much lower than that of native speaking English learners in Los Angeles. And, you know, at that time, I felt so bad. My teacher FXC hit the bottom then. But what's good about hitting the bottom is that you can just go up from there. That's what I felt. So uh, since then, I have attended numerous teachers' conferences, including JALT, of course. And um, eventually, I earned a master's degree in teaching young learners from Aston University. In 2010, I attended TESOL con convention in Boston. I felt fully inspired and energized by attending the conference. And on the final day, I had a chance to talk with a school teacher in the US. I, I, I remember that she was from Texas. And you know, naturally we talk about our teaching background and I told her that my classes meet once a week for one hour. The moment I said it, her eyes popped wide open, and she said, that's nothing. Did I feel defeated? Yeah, but only for a moment. Since then, I further improved my teaching by adding a strong literacy program while maintaining the length of the lessons around 60 minutes, and gradually, I started to witness my students enjoy English literature and expressing their thoughts in writing and engaging in active conversation by themselves. And actually, quite a few of them have, you know, won and earned some prestigious awards. But I noticed something was missing. What was missing? It was the connection with the real world. So, in 2015, I started um, to implement this project, Intercultural Exchange Project. You know, these projects are very simple, just exchanging letters and videos. Fortunately, I met very dedicated teachers from these countries on the internet, on social media. Can you name the countries? Brazil, Brazil Spain, Spain. <laughs> I knew what was coming. Israel? Slovenia. Yeah. <laughs> so, when I started this project, I was not sure if I could do well because of my previous experience with uh, you know, elementary school in Los Angeles. But once I started, I was totally amazed by my students' enthusiasm for this project. They did meticulous research on the country they were interacting with. And, uh, you know, their work shows so much care and genuine interest. And, um, you know, the compassion um, in these letters. I was very, very much impressed by their effort. And they took initiative in their own learning. And each student's courage shone through these projects. I figured 
that this project very naturally creates space for autonomy for young learners. And witnessing the joy they express when they receive beautiful letters and messages and videos from their global peers, I was totally amazed and I felt so rewarded by the efforts by them and by myself. And these projects usually finished after several exchanges of letters and videos. And every time I finished the project, my students begged me for more interaction with the same friends. So they wanted to do more. They didn't want the projects to finish. In October last year, I conducted a post-project um, post -project student survey to gain some insights into how these activities have you know, affected my students' motivation and multicultural awareness. And these are the, some of the findings. I'll, I'll keep it simple here. Um, more than 25% of students said, showed some sort of multicultural awareness. And some of the comments are very interesting like this. One boy said, Brazilian children spend more time with their families than us. We are too busy. How true is it? And about a quarter of my students expressed some sort of appreciation for the value of English as a lingua franca. One girl said, my Spanish friend Diego Kun is learning English just like me. That's cool. And all the students wanted to do more exchange projects. So I was very much encouraged by, um, by this result. And uh, you know, this kind of result and the way that students respond to each project kind of bolst bolstered my self student and teacher efficacy. I, I call myself a student of teaching. So uh, teacher efficacy and student efficacy as a teacher. And uh, I, try, I started to try and look for more varied way to connect my students with uh, students in foreign, foreign countries. Since then, we've done this uh, project with these countries. Um, can you name the countries again? Spain, Spain Israel, 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 Argentina, Uruguay, Uruguay, and the States, and Turkey. All right. And I will now show you three different types of projects from these five. The first one is a flat piece project with a public school in Spain. In November last year, I started this project with a very dedicated teacher in Spain. I was very fortunate to see her on the internet. Um, this project is pretty much like the Flat Stanley project. Have you ever heard of Flat Stanley project? Many of you do, yeah. So uh, first, the students make their own image using paper, and we call them flat kit. And you know, they just imagine that they have their own life. And they write a letter to the friends in the partner country. And they send the letter and the paper doll together. And the idea was to send out those paper dolls, imagining that they are traveling to those countries as exchange students. In the letters, um, they introduced themselves and they wrote about their hobbies and the food they like and stuff like that. Then the Spanish friends took the Japanese friends' paper dolls to somewhere in town and took some photos and sent the flat, flat, uh, flat friends back to my students with their letters to explain the journey they took together in Spain. Usually it took about one month for my students to get the letters back. And the moment they receive their flat kids back home and the letters from friends, oh my God, their facial expressions tell all. Whenever they receive messages from friends, they express enormous joy and demonstrate a collaborative effort to understand messages. Now, I'd like you to take a look at the way they put their heads together to re read a letter from their friends. Take a look. Er, mm.
working like a group of detectives, you know, yeah. trying to solve a puzzle using all the clues, including the photograph. Mm -hmm. You know, you, perhaps you could see that they were driving their own learning without my help. And in the same way, my students received the flat kiss and the letters from their friends in Spain. And they took care of the flat kiss as if they're exchange students. And let me show you two examples. Aiko is a, was the fourth grader, and um, she took the friend Anton to the beach, and she explained the reason. She wrote in the letter, you like fishing, I like fishing too. So I took flat Anton to the beach. And you can see Issei, Issei came back to my class uh, with a letter and the flat, uh, flat to Nico, and he rushed into my classroom and he said, Mary, Mary sensei, I fed Nico-chan gold beef ice cream because he likes ice cream. He said, he fed ice cream to the doll. <laughs> so what we see here is a deep emotional involvement and personal connection. And as you know, students choose to exercise their um, learner agency when they are emotionally engaged in an activity. And let me show you how an older student, whose name is Shunwei, experienced this. Shunwei is a very active boy. Everybody loves Shunwei. And he loves to read English books, but he doesn't show much interest in writing. On the screen, you can see a sample from his diary is rather short and dry. <coughs> Every week he likes kind of the same thing. So it looks like he was just going through the motion. And Shunye was assigned two Spanish partners for this project. How do you compare these letters <laughs> with his diary? Very, very different. So these letters are much more detailed and it has his, they have their, his heart in it. And I found some very interesting fact about him. He wrote in a letter like, he likes singing in the creaming time at school. I can just imagine that. <laughs> and he likes dancing. Oh yeah, I can imagine that. <laughs> and he got two flat kids from Spain. One is Maria, there's a girl. The other is Diego, there's a boy. And what you can see here is a letter covers that Shunye created for these two friends. I was so surprised that he cared to use different colors for the letters, for boys and the girl. And he added the polka dots for the girl. And I asked, I asked him why. And he said, yeah, I just thought that she would love something kawaii. <laughs> And here is the inside of the letter. Letter to the girl. He wrote, I went to 21st century museum with my father, mother, and you. It's because you like art. Yeah, she wrote that she liked art in her letter. You can see the little doll there. Fratinuria in the picture. Mm -hmm. And here's a letter to Diego. He wrote, you play soccer. I play soccer too. What's your soccer position? And he took a picture with uh, his soccer uniform. Can you see the little Diego standing on the uniform? Yeah, mm -hmm. and the ball, his ball. So what we see here is his genuine thoughts for his friends and in initiative and conscientiousness. He really cared about his friends. I told him that I was very much impressed by his effort, and this is what he said. How can I let my, my friends down? That's what he said. Maybe he can let down me, but not his friends. <laughs> <laughs> to examine the student's sense of agency while working on this project, I conducted a post-project survey with 44 students. This questionnaire was designed re referring to the ind indices presented in the influence of teaching on students' engagement, mindset, and agency report published by the Achievement Gap Initiative at Harvard University. 
Oh, that is mouthful. Cool. <laughs> the key elements associated with learner agency are happiness, punctuality, conscientiousness, good conduct, help seeking, satisfaction, and mastery orientation. And for each statement shown here, the students were given three choices to choose from. Yes, no, and not sure. And the numbers on the right side show um, <coughs> the number or the percentage of the students who responded with yes to the presented statements. Yeah, of course, I acknowledge that this is a really small scale classroom research. And you know, the kids are especially eager to please a teacher, so the results might be a little biased. But the result was overwhelmingly positive and matched with my class, classroom observation. So it kind of gave me the sense of reassurance. So, and in the survey, I asked the students what sort of project they wanted to do. And some of them showed interest in online activities. So I started an online intercultural exchange project with my teenage students a year ago. Now I have to give a big shout out to Chiuki. Chiuki there, thank you very much for you know, introducing the teacher Howard, Howard Jones to me. Um, Howard is a teacher um, at art school in Israel. Um, so we did an interaction, we, we did an exchange project online. It was the first time for me. I was not sure if it was, not, it was going well or not, but anyway, I, you know, I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. So at first, my students and the students in Israel um, exchange the project using exchange the uh, exchange the messages through the text on the blog, which uh, Howard Jones made for us, and it lasted about one month, and then all the students on both sides read a story, short story written by an Israeli author, and my students wrote very serious book reports about the short story, and put them up on this blog site. Each entry, each writing was about 300 words. That is what my students did. Now, take a look at the video message from Israeli students on the same book. Okay, video report. Here we go. Hello, today we're at the scene with the 10th grade of Rhodes School of Arts in Haifa. This very special class is reading a story called A Summer's Reading. We're here at the scene with the class. We're going to interview them now. Shai, what do you think about the story? Uh, first of all, hi, Marco. And I think it's the most boring story I've ever read in my life, and I read a lot. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> or, uh, um, do you relate to one of the characters? Um, yeah, I relate to George because he's really lazy and he's a dropout, which I aspire to be. <laughs> Come on, what do you have to say about this story? Uh, the story is nice. I don't know, like, I don't know if you're good, it's not that good of a writer. Thank you, Javon. And last but not least. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. Oops, sorry, what's going on? Um, does it go backward? Sorry. Um, does it go backward? My clicker isn't working now. Okay. Sorry. Um, that was my mistake. Everyone makes a mistake. Live streaming. Hi, very makes sense. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, the last boy said he just read the first sentence and he just didn't read the book. <laughs> and my students watched this video. And what was your impression of this? Very honest, brutally honest for the teacher. And my students said, what? Is it okay to be so casual? 
And I said, yeah, it is okay if you want to. <laughs> um, and they said they wanted to make something casual. But unfortunately, that was the last lesson for this project. You know, always a classroom reality kicks in. So I am, my student has already prepared some very serious goodbye message that was about Japanese traditional culture. <laughs> so they had already prepared a speech. Each of them had prepared a speech at home. So I said, okay, I'll give you now 15 minutes to discuss. And uh, they decided to put the speeches together and make it fun somehow in 15 minutes. And you're gonna see what they have made. I will just show the first part. introduce miso. This is Japanese traditional seasoning and this has a salty taste. Can you guess what miso is made from? Actually, this is made from soybean. So we call miso soybean paste in English. And miso is uh, used for a lot of dishes. And the most uh, famous one is miso soup. It just mi uh, melts miso in boiled water and put some ingredients in it. And it's very easy to make, and it's so delicious, so all, uh, almost all of Japanese eat it every day. Yeah, it was a kind of messy. It was kind of messy. I knew that it was gonna be messy, but it was the best effort they could make to feel the connection with the Israeli friends. Um, I think it was worth doing, trying. And at the end of the project, I asked the students to write reflective comments regarding language use, cultural awareness, and the online communication. And the amount of the content or the feedback showed their enthusiasm for this project. Here are some examples uh, from the, their comments. The first one, I really like the way our Israeli friends communicated in such a relaxed manner. I wanted to be like them. By the way, I want to make miso soup with him one day. <laughs> that miso boy. You know, his father has a company and his dream is to, you know, inherit the business and, you know, make the company global. That's why he's studying English so hard. <laughs> That's really true. Uh, the second comment, to be honest, I had this image of Israel being a bit scary and always at war, but our friends were very friendly and funny. I shouldn't trust what the, what the media say all the time. So you, if you will, you can start you know, a media literacy project with this comment. The final comment here, compared to interacting through actual letters, we could communicate much more often with our friends using online platform. I felt, I, I felt like I was actually chatting with my friend face to face. So, having confirmed that students can gain so much knowledge and experiences through online projects, I decided to try it out with my younger students. This spring, I registered my school at iEARN. iEARN is an international educational resource network. And that is an NGO that promotes online collaboration across cultures. More than 30, uh, 30 schools from 140 countries are registered on the site. Through this organization, I had a very, very you know, like you saying, you know, I met a um, teacher from Uruguay. Um, she's really wonderful, she's really committed, and we started a project online. We use an online bulletin board called Padlet. So using the Padlet, um, teachers can put up the photograph or videos, even the worksheets and PowerPoints, and share the materials with anybody, you know, in anywhere. But if you use a safe mode, um, only the people who get the link can access the site. So it's very safe, in my opinion. <coughs> of course, the first topic my student chose for the discussion was snack. Everybody loves snack. 
And I asked my students to take a photo of their snack time at home for me to put up on this page with a message, their message. And I was so surprised because most of the students said their favorite snack was manju, <laughs> steam bun with a you know, bean paste in it. Be maybe because they are, they live in there and they grew up in Kanazawa. <laughs> Nobody mentioned cookies or cake or chocolate or ice cream. That was a huge shock for me. <laughs> and we got this question from Uruguay. It's very difficult to make. Uh-oh. Nobody in the class, including me, have made manju at home. <laughs> have you? No, no, no. So, well, I was like, okay, what can I do? So uh, we did a quick research on the internet and we found a very nice, simple video on how to make manju on YouTube. So I put it up on the site and I showed the video to my students and I made a worksheet for the students to learn some recipe expressions. Can you imagine what happened next? All of my students, all of my students, without my asking, made manju at home <laughs> and sent me, the, sent me the photos and letters and messages. So this site was proof manju, nothing else. <laughs> I never imagined that this would happen. And it's very interesting how a project like this starts to take on its own life. And the surprise, didn't stop here. Children in Uruguay <laughs> made manju at school too. And they share these lovely photos with us. And of course they shared information about their favorite traditional food, uh, snack, totas fritas. Um, there is like a fried cake which looks like a donut. And of course, my student had to make them at home. Only the teacher didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and they kind of upgraded the cake by uh, you know, using the shape of a bear or the heart and topping with a homegrown blueberry. Yeah, how lovely is that? And this project is still going on very strong and we've exchanged videos and class book, actual paper class books and PowerPoint presentation by now. And at one point, the embassy of Uruguay visited the school to observe the project. Oh, wow. wow. So, as you have seen, the driving force of this kind of project is curiosity, desire for connection, and agentic behaviors of the students. And as a teacher, I'm constantly challenged to make moment-to-moment -moment decision. And in addition, the teachers across the border and I keep in good contact because they have their own curriculum, needs, and goals. So we are together, we are kind of uh, improvising and try to make, create something meaningful and um, wonderful for all of us. Sometimes we make great things happen and other times things, doesn't, you know, <coughs> things don't work very well. But through all these experiences, we, as a collaborative team, develop the skills and mindsets that we need to be global citizens. Now, some of you must be wondering if it's possible to implement intercultural exchange projects within the education ministry school system. Yes, it is. Actually, quite a lot of teachers have been doing that. And I had the fortune to interview some of them in the past several months and I'm going to share with you three cases. The first case is Yokosuka Gakuin Chogako, Yokosuka Gakuin Elementary School in Kanagawa. Um, they have this core principle of English education at school to nurture globally minded and confident students who will continue on a lifelong journey with English. And they have three hour English instruction time per week in all grades. And they have very strong literacy program and they actively use ICT. 
and what emerged from the interview with the wonderful teacher here, Miss Abby Shino, is that passion for global education at this school is shared by all the teachers and principals and everybody at this school. And they work towards the same goal, helping each other and supporting each other. I think that is a key to success at this school. And here is one of the projects they have done so far. That is a teddy bear project, a travel teddy project. And this project is organized by IRN that I mentioned before. Um, this is pretty much like a flat, um, uh, flat keys or well, flat Stanley. They exchange teddy bears as exchange students and take photos and write journals and they exchange the information through the online platform. They have done this project with several countries, including Australia, India, and Germany. And grades five and six students work on the Flat Stanley project. Um, they have done this project with more than 20 countries. Amazing, isn't it? And the next case is an ongoing effort at Kanazawa's public school, public elementary schools. Um, English education has been done at my, my, in my city since 2006 as a special deregulated area for English education. Um, you know, their intercultural action projects have been coordinated by Professor Shimizu Kazuhisa at Kanazawa Seiyo University. And I have done an interview with him and I figure that he has been providing lots of support, continuing support to the school teachers, for example, like meeting, workshops, and, and casual, you know, meet up. And uh, I think, I believe that that is a key for them to keep on going with the project. And almost all the costs have been covered by uh, Professor Shimizu's research grants. One of, the one of the projects they have done is Art Mile Project. Uh, in this project, the students on both sides of the countries create one large mural. Students in one country make half of the mural. The students in the other country make the other half of the mural. And during the production stage, they interact a lot using ICT. And at the end, they create one large mural. According to Professor Shimizu, children show you know, incredible ingenuity and collaborative skills when the communication is almost broken down between the teachers. <laughs> and that, yeah, those things happen. Everybody makes mistakes, right? <laughs> so those things happen. And by seeing the students working so hard to help the teachers, the teachers are encouraged and motivated and inspired. And that gives energy to the teachers. And they have been doing the TDBA project. And this academic year, four public schools are doing this project with an elementary school in Taiwan. And I was so amazed about, at the drive that Mr. Shimizu had for this project. So I asked him, you know, where does the passion come from? And he said this, children who have engaged in projects like these will not think of starting a war with a country they have formed a personal connection to. Powerful, isn't it? Yeah, a big applause to him. And the final case um, is uh, the project that has been done at Municipal Hikuzato High School in Nagoya. Hey, Nagoya people, you should be proud of, proud of this school and a teacher who has been managing this project. This project. So, uh, Ms. Nisho Arata has been, has been um, conducting the online discussion project um, in the last several years. It's very interesting. Her approach is very interesting. Uh, she applied for micro grants offered by the US Embassy and she got the support of 50,000 yen. And she used a fund to set up the Wi Fi connection and to purchase the ICT equipment to do this project. And her creative approaches have been really amazing to me, you know, and um, let me now show you how she does it. Just one of the many projects that she has been actually doing. 
So here is the online discussion uh, she has conducted in 2018 with uh, general course students and two former exchange students in Finland and Switzerland. You know, the third grade students at senior high school, they have enormous pressure to do well at the entrance exam for university. So how do she motivate those students to get engaged in these projects? First, she chose a topic, gender equality, and told the students that gender equality is one of the most often discussed subjects in entrance exams. Isn't that really smart? <laughs> yeah, and also she used the passage from her textbook. In the first lesson, um, the students read the passage about gender equality in the textbook and they did a discussion and reading comprehension. In the second lesson, they engaged in in-class discussion on gender inequality, inequality in Japan. Maybe they have a lot to talk about. <laughs> and in the final lesson, finally, <laughs> you are laughing, sorry. Am I funny? As usual, sorry. It's really true, yeah. And in the third lesson, um, Finally, in the third lesson, students got engaged in online discussion with the students in Finland and Switzerland. Yeah. So I was very much impressed and inspired by Ms. Michelle's ingenuity in coordinating these kind of uh, projects in her own you know, teaching context with a lot of constraints. So I asked her the secret of success during the interview. And here's what she said. Reach out for help and the doors will open. Yeah, indeed. To make collaboration across borders happen, we first need to reach out and collaborate with colleagues in and around our own community. Now everybody look around. Look around. You have wonderful co-workers, colleagues here. So you might find somebody to do the project with today. Next academic year, elementary schools in Japan are starting to implement a new English language curriculum based on the new course of study published um, last year by Education Ministry. Have you read the document? Mm -hmm. And here's what they aim to promote in foreign language activity periods and foreign language classes. Okay? Agentic and interactive deep learning development of basic communicative skills, purposeful use of language with an authentic audience, problem solving through collaborative work, intercultural activities that raise the awareness of diverse cultures, and collaboration with families, local communities, and beyond. How do these principles match with intercultural exchange projects? Perfectly, I would say. Of course, it's easier said than done, and we often hear these voices of concern and frustration from school teachers. Overwork, yeah, I know, it's very hard. And constraints in instruction time, and insufficient training for teachers, and new textbooks that they are going to use from the next academic year. But, you know, there are so many teachers who have been making so much success. So what can we learn from success stories? First, we need to establish shared vision within institutions and collaboration with various educational institutions can help us open the new doors. We can start small, for example, with just one exchange of letters. And just like we expect our students to do, we all learn by doing and making <coughs> mistakes. And we all, including our students, grow together. By the way, at the beginning of this session, I talked about my bitter experience of the first exchange project, remember? With Los Angeles, 
uh -huh. with Edwin Field School in Los Angeles. I felt that was a total failure. But last year, one of the students who worked on this project when she was six years old, visited me with a souvenir from Sweden, and she gave me this note. The letter exchange changed my life. The very first letter from a foreign country included a photo of a girl whose skin and the face parts were totally different from me. The experience made a huge impact on me. Without the experience, I would never have traveled 10 countries all by myself. I found my ikigai passion for life, thanks to the project. Now, let me conclude my talk with this question. Is collaboration across borders nothing? Thank you very much.